uh, Patrick and Dean, thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, august occasion location. It's history. It's history. It represents. And so, what I thought I'd do a little bit uh, this evening is uh, share some thoughts and ideas I have about the American condition, its political condition. And uh, well, let me start off with a personal story because it has some relevance to what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. And then afterwards, perhaps take some questions and comments. And uh, please do not throw chairs. <laughs> uh, much of my family was uh, eliminated in the Holocaust. And um, so my mom and dad survived and they got uh, over to England where my sister and I were born. And when I was five, they managed to buy four tickets on the Queen Mary. And so they came over to America. It was uh, January 24th, 1949. And they pulled into the New York Harbor going by the Statue of Liberty. Now, Understand, I'm only five years old, so my memory of that is very limited. Although I do remember everyone being called up on the top deck of the Queen Mary as it sailed by the Statue of Liberty. And it was freezing. It's January in New York. And uh, what I remembered, what scared me at the time, is that not only was it so freezing cold, but here you had 2,000 people on the top deck of the Queen Mary, and there was stone silence. Nobody said a word. And my mom told me in later years that I had asked her at the time, you know, what are we looking at? What does this statue mean? And she said in the German she spoke, uh, responding to the uh, English she barely understood at the time, she says, Ein Tag alles. Um, one day it'll, it'll mean everything. And I'm here to tell you that she was right. And I'm living proof of that. In one generation, my family went from this craziness of uh, extermination to the craziness of this ridiculous show that I do today. All things are possible. In America, all things are possible. I know it. This is not a political speech. I believe it with every ounce of feeling and being I have. So I take the concept of the American idea and its ideal very, very seriously. And it is not partisanship. I believe in this thing we call America. And yet, if I'm being brutally honest, I'm not sure this dream that was available to me and those of my generation is so much available to most people anymore. I think for the first time, it's in question. We give the speech. We love our country. We sing the national anthem or God Bless America during the seventh inning stretch. But do we really believe it? And is it really available? Understand this. We may be the first generation in the 230-year history of America where we cannot look at our children and promise that they will have it better than we did. Every generation of Americans has been able to do that, no matter how difficult the times. Civil War, World War, Depression, you, child, will have it better than we had it. And you would work and do whatever you did, two jobs, three jobs. You would sacrifice so your kids would have it better. I don't know if we can promise that anymore. Why? America is the only nation I ever heard of that was created by an idea. It was an idea that if you let human beings be free, and pursue their own destiny, they can have happiness. And we believe that. 
but we believed that it would happen for a middle class. We were the first middle class nation in history. Our whole history has been middle class. All nations have rich people, even the poorest countries. And all nations have poor people. But we were the one nation where the driving force, the whole economic system, the whole political system, was based on the notion that you could be middle class in America and all things were possible. We would not ask who your parents were, where you prayed, what color your skin was. Well, we did in the beginning. But even that was a cancer from the very beginning that even though we were brutally horrible about it, we kind of knew that it wasn't right. And finally, ultimately, we saw that and things started to change. But basically, this was a middle class country. In the beginning, the middle class was agrarian. Everybody would have their 40 acres of land. And you would work the 40 acres of land, grow your own food, your own crops, make enough of a living that you could save enough so your kids would have it better. You could dream on those 40 acres of land. And then the middle class moved into the cities. And you could be a factory worker. And thanks to the unions, conditions would be made OK for a factory worker, for a laborer. And you'd have benefits. And you could live on your 50-foot lot with a barbecue pit out back. You'd be middle class, maybe two weeks vacation, very modest. But by God, you would work hard, and your kids would have it better. The American dream prevailed. And then the middle class moved into the high tower office buildings, and it became white collar. But you still would work hard and be anything you wanted to be. It was possible. It wasn't the guarantee, but it was possible. But now, I don't know. The middle class is in great jeopardy of continuing to be that. As we get richer, the few, and the rest get poorer and poorer. And what is the evidence of that? The evidence of that first is who can afford to go to college anymore? If the middle class can't afford to send their kids to college, we will lose the middle class. I am not saying you cannot get a job if you don't go to college. I am saying the odds of getting a competitive job, a well-paid job, a job with a future, a job with upward mobility, is so much reduced if you don't go to college that you're not going to be able to compete in this global economy. Well, if the middle class can't go to college, the middle class can't compete, the middle class won't have the future. We will become a nation like so many others of the very few on top and everybody else just scrabbling to make it. There goes America. If we don't have a middle class with possibilities and low-income people with the possibility of moving into the middle class and thereby being free to be the best they can be, we're done. We'll be a piece of land. We'll have a population. We'll have our monuments, we'll have our pretty scenery, we'll be nothing special. Nothing special. So what do we do about it? Well, you have to make education affordable. So that a middle class, first of all, that everyone can start out to be at least middle class. It means education has to be the top priority, doesn't it? It means you have to start with early childhood education. You have to start so that a three-year-old, a five-year-old kid that goes to the first grade in an inner city or rural community with intense density of poverty isn't competing with a wealthy kid that starts the first grade at five years old. It's not a competition. There is chaos in poverty. And when that child goes to school in the first grade, the first day of school, that child doesn't even know the name of his parents or her parents, doesn't know what the address is. It's just mom and dad. You think that kid's really competing 
with a child who grew up, is growing up in a home with the books around and parents are reading and education is important. Oh, you're going to do well in school. This is great. Isn't it exciting? What did you do in school today? Let me help you with your homework and all this kind of stuff. No, it's not a competition. So the kid falls behind. By the time the child is in the fifth, you know, second, third grade, so far behind, never catches up. Don't worry about throwing computers at them at high school. It's too late. You've lost them in the first grade. That's a national commitment. Everybody talks about national defense. Where's the national offense? The national offense, our minds, our education. That's going to make us competitive in this world. They're learning in China. They're learning in India. They're learning all around the world. And what are we doing? What's the only thing you're allowed to vote against in our society? Schools. You remember voting on the Iraq war? I don't. Was that on the ballot? You don't vote on anything except local school levies. You don't think our children get that, that education is a low priority? So a, a loving grandmother who loves a grandchild, but she's on fixed income. Her husband passed away, living in a house that's already been paid for, but she's on fixed income. She can't vote for an increase in a, in a property tax for her schools. So she votes no. We build in a no vote on education in the communities that most need it. Now, if we're going to save the middle class, we have to be able to get kids in the middle class an education, that they have an opportunity to grow and be whatever they want to be. But first, of course, we need national defense. If we can't defend ourselves, we're not a country. We're not talking about the same thing. Right now, you're thinking I'm just talking about the military. That's important. But let me tell you what's killing Americans and what can kill our nation. Maybe one thousandth of one percent of Americans will leave this planet because they are unlucky enough to be in a building that gets hit by a plane. Maybe one millionth of one percent. I don't know. 99.9% .9 of us will leave this earth because of a disease or an accident. That is the known guaranteed killer. If we know that disease or accidents are ultimately going to end our lives, why wouldn't we defend ourselves against that? Ergo, health care health insurance. That's the number one national defense issue. Why is that the low priority? How 50 years after Harry Truman are we still arguing about it? Where's the morality in that issue? You think it's okay that rich people have a longer life expectancy than middle income or poorer people? You think lower income or middle income people don't love their children too? 40 million Americans without health insurance? 20, 30, 40 million more that have health insurance but don't go to the doctor because they can't afford the deductibles? Or the first time they go it's the emergency room and then maybe it's too late? It's the great moral issue of all. You want to talk morality? It's not about silly television shows. It's about the fact that we let Americans die or live very difficult lives because they can't even protect themselves against disease. Why? Why do we tolerate it? Democrat or Republican? I'm a lifelong Democrat, but I got to tell you, and we're going to, well, I shouldn't say this, but it's going to happen. We're going to win in a landslide. <laughs> Here's the thing. Okay. But, well, let me tell you, and save the tape, <laughs> if we don't have health insurance for all Americans in the next four years, because we're going to have a Democratic president, we're going to have a Democratic Congress, we're going to have a Democratic Senate, no more excuses. If we don't have it in the next four years, I will do everything I can as an individual citizen to beat these people in the next election. Our country is more important than our party.
We should demand it. That's national defense, first. It's our known enemy. It's the only way we're going to pay attention to saving American life is if it comes in a suicide bomber? I mean, where is the intelligence here? Well, so we have to save. We have to go back to the American dream. You can't have an American dream unless you have a viable middle class. Because remember, the dream is possibilities. The dream is whatever your condition at birth, in this country, you're going to have a shot of making it. And you can't have a shot of making it if you can't even go to a doctor. You can't have a shot of making it if you don't have an education. That is our priorities. Now, what's the difference between liberals and conservatives? The ideology. What is the difference in it? I think it's this. And by the way, I say, well, let me say it this way. First of all, from my point of view, here's the good news, having nothing to do with this election. The liberals won. And we won 20 years ago. We've won, and we don't recognize it. We won, and we got lazy. And so other ideologies, other forces, got, in charge, got into politics and got in charge of the governmental offices. But America, do not kid yourself. I don't care how conservative you think you are. I don't care how conservative a neighborhood you live in. Talk to your kids. See what your kids wear. Look at them, listen to the music they listen to. Listen, look at their lifestyles. When I started my ridiculous show 18 years ago, we did shows on interracial dating. And people were outraged, and we had protesters, and they wrote letters, and how can you talk about a subject like that? We are about to have a president of the United States that is the son of an interracial marriage. You don't think America's become more liberal, more open? You go to college campuses today, you think people go up in arms if they see a gay person? I'm telling you, America lives totally liberally. But we got too comfortable, and in a sense, too elitist, and we didn't have time for politics or government. And the other side got organized, and they were better at it, and they got control of the offices. And I'm here to tell you, look, this isn't personal at all. There are Republicans in my own family. <laughs> it isn't personal. Look, they're very good, loving, warm people that love their country and everything else. It isn't like a Democrat is a better human being than a Republican. Of course not. But the ideology, the ideology on the other side has failed. And what I mean by that is, do not think that all the disasters of the last eight years are just a coincidence. It is a result of policies. Purposeful po We purposely went into Iraq. It didn't just happen. It was a purposeful decision to go into Iraq, and it's brought the turmoil and the way we are viewed by the rest of the world now. That was a governmental decision, and it was wrong. And the incompetence around Katrina, that's a governmental act. And it may be controversial to say, but let me say it anyway, because I really believe it. And I'm not trying to be mean. But if that Superdome which was filled with, what, 10,000 people. If those were 10,000 white, blonde-haired cheerleaders from high school, I promise you those helicopters, any vehicle that exists in the United States of America would have been there to get those people out within five hours. And we know that's the truth. It's not that people in government hate black people. Of course not. We've got to get away from that. There isn't hate there. It's that it's not even on the radar screen. The, 
It's just that's the problem. It's not on their sensitivities charts. It's not, well, it's not that big a problem. They're poor. I mean, didn't Barbara Bush go in and say, you know, based on some of the conditions of living, it's not that bad here in the Superdome. <laughs> and she wasn't trying to be mean. She's not a mean woman. She's probably a lovely lady. But it's not part of the, whoa, this is going on in life, and something needs to be done about it. And certainly, the economic crisis we're in right now, it's a positive governmental decision to deregulate across the board. Leave big business alone. Tax breaks for people like me. What the hell are you giving me a tax break for? You think if you give me a tax break, I'm going to buy something else? <laughs> so, so what do we do about all this? We need to change. Honestly, if Obama doesn't win, and I'll be honest with you, I, I worked as hard as I could for Hillary Clinton. So, you know, and I wanted her to be the candidate. Well, <laughs> but I'm very happy now with Obama. I was, you know, I, I wanted Hillary, but I'm very happy now with Obama. And look, I can recognize that, wow, this guy got what he's brilliant. He really knows how to communicate. His temperament is wonderful in a world that people are ready to go off the deep end. So I think it's all that we need. Is it guaranteed that life will be better in four years? No, it's not guaranteed. That's what I'm saying. Feet have to be held to the fire. Perform in the next four years or don't come and ask for re-election. We, those of us who are Democrats, have to say that. We have to be willing to go against our party. Political politics isn't a sport. How many times do we hear on cable to say, oh, this is a contact sport? Wrong. It's not a sport. It's life. You want a sport? You know, root for your favorite football team, baseball team. That's, that's where you have loyalty. But in politics, the only loyalty is the country and the community. How do we make life better for each other? Take care of yourself and each other. It's not just a slogan at an end of a TV show. It's a philosophy of life. Sure, take care of yourself. But take, let's take care of each other. This is a community. We're in this together. Government exists to provide protection. The difference between a liberal and a conservative philosophy, we both agree on that. Both sides agree on that. Government exists to provide protection. But the difference is a conservative will say that the protection has to be, the role of government is to provide protection against physical kinds of violence. A strong military to provide protection against an attack. Strong police department to provide protection against crime. All very serious issues, and I agree, they're right. We do need protection against that. Let's not kid ourselves. They're people that do want to hurt us in our own neighborhoods and around the world. We do need strong protection against physical violence. But those of us who are progressive or liberal say there are other kinds of violence too. Economic violence, social violence, cultural violence, the violence of a pink slip, a parent coming home at the, on a Friday afternoon with a pink slip. Thank you very much, but you can't, we can't use you anymore. What do you say to your family? What do you say to your kids? How are you going to pay their tuition? How are you going to pay the rent? How are you going to pay the energy bills? What are you going to do? You're 40, 45 years old. Am I a failure in life? This pink slip? What do I do now? That is violence. Your kid's sick and you can't afford to go to the doctor? You hear the screams? Is that not violence? So the reason I am so committed to this more progressive liberal ideology is not to win an argument. It's because that's what real life is about. And you know what? When someone in your family is hurt, we're all liberals. When your next door neighbor has a, is something happens, we're all liberals. I don't care 
How conservative you think you are if the next door neighbor comes running over my child sick, could you help, could you rush us to the hospital, could you lend me a few bucks so I can take care of it quickly or whatever? You, you, you take out your wallet as quickly as you could. What does it cost? Of course, of course we'll help. So it isn't the lack of a heart. It's not that conservatives are bad human beings, bad people. Not No, it's not about that. It's about recognizing in a society of 300 million people, the government has to be involved. We want the government to be involved. Didn't we all, after 9-11, didn't we all want the government to take over the, uh, uh, at, at the airports? The inspectors, uh, you know, the people, the security guards that look at your luggage and everything. Oh, no, no, we don't want these private firms. Let, let the government do it. Let's make sure we're all safe. We all want government when we think we're in danger. And I'm just here to say that when people are in danger of losing their jobs, when people are in danger of not being able to afford to go to a doctor, when people are in danger of not being able to get an education and therefore not be able to get a decent job or, or use their minds and, and have as mo wonderful life as they can, that's, that's scary, that's danger. They're asking for help. And the government will play a role in that. And we're all only too happy to have it when it's our own life. Do we not call the fire department when there's a fire? It's government. Do you not call, call a police officer when there's been a robbery? That's the government. Do you complain when you're caught? Well, you don't get it so much here in the South, but in the North, we got all our potholes and everything. Of course we want the government to make our lives better. Just assume if you would like your life to be better, then so does your next door neighbor. And so does the person you don't even know living two blocks away on the other side of town. I swear they love their children just as much. That's what our government is about. Government has a role. If we are going to have a middle class, which means do you really want to continue with America? If you want to continue with the American dream, you have to have a middle class. And unless the government gets involved, we're not going to have a middle class. If it's every person for themselves, screw everybody else, then you'll have a few that will be rich and the rest that will be poor. You have to have a government to make sure that the people at the bottom have a chance to enter the race. The people in the middle have a chance to be whatever they want to be. You can't be standing up at the seventh inning stretch and saying you love America if you can't bring yourself to love Americans and to recognize why their lives are in danger unless we help with the most basic needs. Ein Tag alles, one day everything. That's got to be said to every child in America. Thanks for having me. We have time for a couple of questions. Please raise your hand. We have some mics roaming around, and I will identify you and stand up. Please ask your question. Are you right there, sir? One second. Use your mic. Here. Good evening, Mr. Springer. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm a fan of your show. But I only you, watch you it, can get help. I only watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but I promise you, only watch it when there's no school. Yeah. But as a local principal here in Little Rock, um, I was happy to hear you talk about education. And what is your opinion of No Child Left Behind? And do you know about the year 2014? Uh, well, my opinion. No Child Left Behind had an interesting concept to begin with, uh, but it obviously has not been adequately funded, and that, that's the first thing. So it's, it becomes relatively meaningless. 
Secondly, I don't think that you can really, I'm not against having you know, standards for education, obviously, but it doesn't, you can have all the standards you want and you can punish as many schools as you want, but if you're not doing anything to help the kids get educated, recognizing the problems for why they're not being educated, then all you're going to do is fail a lot of people. They have to learn. And the, the children, it, let's be honest, most suburban school districts are doing very fine, thank you very much. That's not the problem. When we talk about trouble in our schools, what are we all talking about? Tell the truth. We're talking about schools that are in what I call the red zones, high, where there's a high density of poverty, be that inner city or rural. Where there's a high density of poverty, the chaos of poverty makes learning very, very difficult. And you can't just yell at the teachers. You've got a kid coming to school who has been up all night babysitting the younger, his younger or her younger siblings because one, maybe there's no dad, Two, mom is either at work or doing whatever else. And so this kid is tired. What does the kid come to and hasn't had breakfast and comes to school and goes to sleep? You know how angry you get or in a bad mood you get when dinner's an hour late, two hours late? You're just, gonna, you're just in a crabby mood. Well, a child is like that too. And the child doesn't learn. And the child isn't going to a home where there are lots of books around and the child's being read to and all that stuff. In other words, the environment is so anti-education to begin with for so many children, not all, so many of these children, that unless we really attack that question, early childhood education, smaller classrooms, individual attention to students, paying, making education, a teaching, a, a profession that the smartest kids when they graduate will want to become teachers. You know, believe me, you could, and I know, I've heard of some experiments already being done. You know, if you got a bright A student, college student graduating, and said to that student, yeah, I hear you, you know, they start you at $120,000 to teach in a local school. How many, they'd be the top students, the most charismatic students. Those students that industry wants, why? Because they're bright, they're quick, they're charismatic, they have a good personality, they know how to make sales, all those qualities that make a good teacher. But you've got to entice those people to want to become teaching. So you can't just say, let's have a program, no child left behind, and we're going to have a test at the end of the year, and we're going to shut the schools down that don't perform. Well, first of all, the schools don't want to be shut down, so what do they do? They teach to the test. Child doesn't learn anything. Child just learns how to take that test and what the, what the questions are going to be on that test. I mean, that's the problem. It's a Band-Aid. You want to fix education? Make teaching an honorable profession and pay it like you mean it. And get those smaller class size, early childhood education. You know, that's, how, that's where you start. Yes. Oh, you need... Oh, you, you, you. I think they need a mic because of... Uh, you people who aren't in television, you don't know anything. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm an educator. I love that last answer. Two small questions. Compare and contrast your political career with your persona of celebrity, and which one gave or gives you more influence? And the second question is, is there any other reason, in addition to the failure of health care, that would drive you back into politics? Uh, well, the, the, the first question, um, what has more influence? Well, the reality is, obviously, celebrity has more influence than being an individual politician, unless you're the president, you know, or, um, and within a, a city, being the mayor can have a lot of influence. But generally, um, the reality in today's culture is U.S. people to name seven U.S. senators, and it'd be embarrassing, the results you would get. Um, you ask people to name their state representative or what district, you know, what state legislative district they're in, they're not going to know. So the truth of the matter is that politicians have less influence than they used to have. Obviously, a president is different. Uh, so my answer to your question is I have a lot more speaking invitations, um, you know, a lot more influence on politics in these last 20 years that have been in show business than I ever did as a mayor. 
not within Cincinnati, but outside Cincinnati. So yeah, that's the answer to the question. Um, and the second part was, oh, other than healthcare, what would get me back in? A, you know, a stroke of insanity would get me back in. Uh, no, I, I think about it all the time. I really do. I mean, every single day I have a discussion about it because it's my passion. It's what I really love. I never wanted politics to be a career uh, because I think as soon as politics becomes your career, you become dishonest. I don't mean stealing. I mean intellectually dishonest. If you have to be elected to put food on your table, then what aren't you going to say to just make sure the public votes for you? So that's one of the reasons we don't have great leadership in America anymore, or few people that are great leaders, but very few leaders, is because everyone's a professional politician and they just want to be reelected. You know, because they love their families and it's, they're suddenly 45 years old, they haven't practiced law in 25 years, you know, they'd be totally incompetent if they, if they lose their office. They're going to say, what am I going to do? You know, why do they all become lobbyists? Because they don't know how to do anything. <laughs> so, uh, and that's, you know, that's built into the system. So I didn't want it to be my career. And, uh, and you know, now I, I just balance all the time. I have my own personal family obligations, which I love. You know, and that becomes a priority. I, you know, so I balance it. I don't know. I've never been able to pull the trigger. I almost decided to run for governor. I almost decided to run for the Senate in, in 04 and 06. But I always stop short of actually jumping in. And, you know, they don't need me. I mean, that's the truth. There are lots of good people. It's not like the country's in trouble if I don't, you know, run for office. So, plus, you know, where the transvestite's going to be unless I do the show. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, they'll give you, she'll give you a microphone. After watching the three presidential debates and seeing that you were coming to town, I thought, what would a presidential debate be like if Jerry Springer was to be the moderator? <laughs> well, there'd be no chairs, they'd be standing. <laughs> Actually, on the subject on debates, they're fun to watch just because, you know, we watch it like we watch entertainment. It's going to be, it's going to be exciting. Is someone going to have a gaffe? But on a serious note about the debates, they don't test any skill that a president is going to have to have. And what I mean by that is, if, if, a question is asked of one of the candidates, and the candidate says, wow, that's a good question. Could you give me a few days to talk to my advisors and come up with an answer? Well, that's exactly what you want a president to do. There is no decision that a president has to make in 45 seconds unless it's a missile and then it's too late anyway. <laughs> so really, and we want them to be glib, we want them to be funny, we want them to and, which is great for show business, but it's totally irrelevant. And with the debates, we're not going to ever have a president, for example, who stutters. We're not going to get a president who isn't somewhat charismatic. We're testing all the wrong skills. And, and I think we're going to, we suffer, usually, not always, because sometimes you get someone who's charismatic who's also good. But it's not always the case. And that to me, I, see, I believe, now this time I'm glad, but generally, in my lifetime, we always vote for the cooler candidate. Sometimes Democrat, sometimes Republican, sometimes liberal, sometimes conservative. But in my 64 years, without exception, we have always voted for the cooler of the two. And you think about it. Uh, Truman was give him hell Harry. And Dewey was like on top of a wedding cake. <laughs> Eisenhower was the hero general, and Adlai Stevenson was the egghead. Kennedy was cooler than Nixon. Uh, then 64, you can't count either way because of the assassination. Uh, by 68, with the destruction of the Democratic Party, Nixon, not exactly cool, but he seemed stronger than Humphrey, who just seemed like Happy Hubert. And McGovern was just this viewed, maybe unfairly, 
but as this wishy-washy kind of guy, Nixon again was a strong, this was before Watergate. In 76, Carter was cooler than Ford, and Ford was bumping his head and falling down the steps coming from the plane. <laughs> Reagan was cooler than uh, Mondale or Carter. And uh, Bush was cooler than Dukakis, who was riding around in a tank with a helmet or whatever. <laughs> and Clinton was obviously cooler than Bush, and Clinton was cooler than Dole. And yeah, George Bush was cooler than either Gore or Kerry. I'm not talking about abilities, I'm talking about, remember, uh, uh, Kerry was too, you know, he was windsurfing, and, he, and he, he, his wife was too French. And, uh, and George you could have a beer with, and Gore was too stuffy. Nothing having to do with the, their competence. We never ever ask the question, who's competent? It's always been, who's cooler? We run it like American Idol. <laughs> And I'm saying this time, I think we'll be, you know, luckily the cooler guy I think would be the better president, but, you know, the system is crazy. We have to have, you know, what we ought to do is submit, here's one other thing with the debates that is wrong. The questions are always asked in isolation. And in the real world, the president never deals with an issue in isolation. You ask a president, where do they stand on global warming? Well, they all give the same answer. Where do you stand on poverty? We got to eliminate it. Where do we stand on education? We're for it. Of course. But the questions that are tough are, we may ask a question, where do you stand on abortion, let's say. But then the question becomes, let's say I'm on, I'm, let's say I were really right wing, very conservative, okay? And it was very important to me that a president be right to life. Now you get this economic package. And I voted for this candidate because the candidate, the senator, whatever, was great on right to life. But now this economic package needs a vote. So the president goes to the candidate and says, look, I'll back you on your Supreme Court appointment. Well, I'll give up on my Supreme Court appointment. I'll give someone that's more with your line of thinking. But will you give me this vote on the package that we need to save, uh, you know, the bailout plan or the mortgages? So they start trading votes. That's the real question. And they don't ask those in the debates. The question is, would you, you know, wouldn't you have liked the question to be to get a bailout plan through that you, was necessary to save the economy, would you, and you needed a vote from someone who was right to life, would you have given, changed your Supreme Court appointment that you might have in your term to get that extra vote? Wow. What does the candidate say then? Knowing that whatever he says, he's going to lose votes. That's really being president. Not this game we play like a game show or a debate. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Wait one second. Mike's coming. Is the time constrained because I'm leaving or because they're leaving? <laughs> no, I may. What I'm. What, no, I don't mean to be rude. I'm just saying. Do you? Is there something else going on? Because I don't want. I mean, I'll stay a few more minutes. I mean, I don't care. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, you still won't watch my show. Don't try and get me. <laughs> Go ahead. I feel certain. It's on. Is it on? Can you hear me? Can you yeah, I can hear you. Just talk. Um, I feel certain you probably have a nice sense of history about the South and what we used to be in terms of a, uh, the Democratic South and then came Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Movement and where we are today. And it, and it seems that um, we continue uh, to watch our states go red. Uh, we are the Bible Belt, and we have little tolerance for people who are uh, much different than the norm. What kind of advice would you give to people in the South for how we can um, look inside of ourselves and um, figure out that the new economy uh, especially the new generation of Americans. I was very proud of what you said, that 
They, they're, they, uh, uh, my, my daughters don't, they're not afraid of people different from them. How do we get the South to realize that we are going to lose if we don't become a more tolerant um, society? Um, and, um, okay. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's not a North-South issue. Um, the city of Boston a few years ago had tremendous uh, racial tension uh, over the issue of busing. Uh, this is, you know, the Civil War is long gone. Uh, so the race problem does not belong to the South. It is in some place, you know, it's in pockets, it's in people's hearts, and those hearts move or live anywhere. So I am not here for one second. I'm, mar I'm married a Southerner, so God love her. All right. Uh, Shows she had no judgment, but God love her. So yeah. No, no. Uh, so, uh, and so the question is then, what do we, how, oh, how do we get people to think beyond? Well, uh, first of all, the younger, it's no longer an issue with the younger generation. You know, if you're going to generalize, I would say, Time is on the side of the progressives, on every issue. That's what I said before about the liberals winning. And I wasn't doing it to start an argument or say, oh, there goes that liberal. I, it, it's, it's absurd discussion anymore. The world is far more liberal. America is far more liberal than it ever was. Just look 20 years ago. Just look at television, look at movies, look at music, look at how we live. Look at how you respond to your own children and what is okay now and wasn't okay then. So it, it's totally time, you know, the world is changing and as these young people grow up and move into positions of responsibility and, you know, Barack Obama, a perfect example uh, of, that, of how the world's changing. And how many parents, the dean had a wonderful discussion uh, with me just before we uh, came in here um, telling me of... Uh, of, uh, who was it that told you that? John Dean. Uh, yeah, John Dean had a one, that kids are now talking to their parents. And even though parents had never, for example, voted Democrat before, son and daughter saying, mom, dad, do it for me. Vote for Obama. And we're hearing that more and more. And it's not just because he's a Democrat. And it's not just because he's cool. Although that's an element and we have to recognize that is that the world is changing. The things that our parents were afraid of, because they had been raised that way, not because they're evil, the, the kids aren't afraid of that. Because that's not in their life. That's not their lifestyle. It doesn't, big deal. They're not offended by someone being gay. They're just not. So, you know, and so that's the good news. Time is on the side. Now let me say this, and I've, I've been in, arguments with some of my support, I mean, people who normally I agree with. And this really is important because I see the media almost going over the edge on this. Uh, and I'm talking about Sarah Palin. We have to be very careful. I disagree with Sarah Palin's views. And I don't think she's yet ready to be if she had to be President of the United States. That is an intellectual, yes. Okay, but that is, I think, a rational viewpoint that I have. Some people disagree, but that, and it's on that basis. But this making fun of Sarah Palin is exactly what alienates a lot of people in this country. Because a lot of people in this country, and I've to even though it's not my religion, love their religion, love their fundamentalism, if that's it. They're very good people. They believe differently in God than the way I believe in God. But we can't, these people are not less than us. And the impression, I get the impression that comes across. It's if she becomes just a, I don't want to talk about Saturday Night Live, that's obvious satire. But just the, the asking questions of her over the top of your glasses kind of thing. I understand why people resent that. And if I were a fundamentalist, if I were a Christian, that, I would find that offensive. And I wouldn't even get into the logical. I said, don't make fun of my people. Don't make fun because I like to hunt. 
Don't make fun because I'm from a small town or I'm from the South. That's what got liberals in trouble. I really believe that. I believe we get, you know, so superior to it all, when the truth is, I happen to have been born to Jewish parents, so therefore I use Jewish traditions to thank God. If I had been born to fundamentalist parents, Christian parents, I would have used Christian traditions to thank God. Use whatever traditions you have. One day, maybe God will tell me what exactly is the answer. Up to now, it's faith, it's a guess, it's a, I just want to say thank you. So Sarah Palin is probably, not probably, I'm sure she's a very good human being. I disagree with her politically. I don't know that she should be our president, but I don't, I'm not going to make fun of the woman. One, she could be, she could learn. For all I know, she could be very smart. She's obviously very charismatic on the other side. How many collections have we been through where we haven't said, oh gosh, if we could have someone who was really charismatic. Imagine if John Kerry was as charismatic as she was with his views. He would have been president. So I think we really have to tone down this cultural warfare, which is elitist. They're right on that. Because the one thing people don't like what the, is the one emotion more than any other that drives politics is resentment. Resentment. You just don't like those other people. You just resent the way they, because they don't like my lifestyle. They make fun, you know, they, it's that. We can't solve that. If we're willing to put resentment aside and the personal judgments we make because someone's different, you know, so we're guilty of that on the liberal side too. I think that is a fair criticism of us because I see it and I'm fighting it. No, I don't want Sarah Pellin to be our vice president, but it's not because of what she believes, it's not because she's not a good person, and it's not because she's not bright, because she could be very bright and she'll learn more. Believe me, in four years from now, we're gonna be running against her. It's a real possibility, but let's not make fun of her culture, which is part of what we're seeing in the media today. That'll be it, thank you.